All right, everybody, welcome to our presentation for Deployed and Depressed uh, Virtual and Face-to-Face -face Interventions for Military Spouses Who um, Suffer from Postpartum Depression and Anxiety. So we're gonna start off with some introductions. So my name is Caitlin. I am a student at the Chicago School and I'm currently in my third year of the master's program. Um, I am currently working in my field work and I will be graduating in August and I will let my co-presenter, Dr. Brown, introduce himself. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, it's so good to be here today and I, I appreciated the opportunity to um, uh, co-present with Caitlin. Um, my name is Dr. Andy Brown and I'm a full-time faculty at the Chicago School. Uh, I also uh, um, work as a uh, the Vice President of Education for the International Trauma Training Institute, where I train and certify traumatologists, and um, am very much uh, into, I'm a, I was raised in, as a military brat, as we would say, and um, am very involved with uh, military and um, re military trauma recovery. All right, so I always like to get started. Um, our presentation with a little bit of backstory. Um, so Dr. Brown and I have a mutual connection with the military. As he stated, um, he is a military brat. Uh, so I know he moved around a lot with his family. I come from a family that um, had no military connection until I joined myself. Um, so I, um, I have served both sides of the spectrum. So I've been the deployed service member. I've been the active duty service member, but I've also been and currently am the spouse of an active duty service member who is currently deployed. And I'm also a military mama. Um, so when I think about deployed or deployment, depression, anxiety, it starts to really bring up um, thoughts of and feelings of separation and thoughts and feelings of loss and loneliness and the unknown. Um, so like I said, um, I've been on both sides and currently right now I am, you know, living the life of a solo parent. Um, my husband has been gone for eight months. Um, we have an 18 month old. So I feel a lot of that separation. And when I say loss, um, I don't mean that, you know, someone could have passed away or, um, but I have the loss of my partner. Um, I have the loss of my child's father just because he is, he's not here. And he's the loss of, of the experience for him. Um, and I also want to reiterate that during this presentation, um, all of these can, you know, all of these feelings can come from both sides. The service member can feel them. The, the family members at home will be feeling them as well. Um, another thing I always like to touch on is the loneliness. Um, so with military families, um, you move around a lot. Um, and when you are in one spot, it, it's hard to make friends. And, you know, as for 2020 uh, in the COVID pandemic stuck at home, it's, it's even more challenging to get out of the house. And it might bring an added fear to go out of the house with, with a child, um, especially a newborn or especially during postpartum anxiety or depression. Um, so the loneliness, it, loneliness starts to build, especially over time. And I also think about uh, the isolation that can happen as well um, and trying to think of ways and interventions to, to avoid that isolation from happening. Um, and the last thing is, is the unknown. So many, many, many military families know the unknown. Um, you don't know when your service member is coming home. Um, some family members don't know if their service member will be coming home, depending on their job. Um, where will we be moving next? Um, where, what can we expect? And that, you know, adds on to the, the depression and anxiety because you just, you, you never know and you can't plan for the unknown. Um, even if the military says, hey, you know, you're gonna be moving here 
And then all of a sudden they're like, actually, we want you to go here. So then there's just that added stressor of the unknown. Um, I also like to mention that dads or moms in the military or parents in the military um, do have the chance of being deployed after they have a newborn. So um, if it's the if it's the father of the child that is, is deploying, um, they, they only get 10 days of paternity leave. Um, as for the mother, they'll get three months of mater maternity leave, but after that three months, they have the opportunity to be deployed. Um, females also get the choice to leave the military if they would like um, after having their child. Um, so, during this presentation, I just like to really reiterate that during postpartum depression and anxiety, especially topped with a deployment, it is really important to normalize how the mom is feeling um, during these times. So what is a deployment? Um, so deployment can be many different things. Um, there's, all, there's many different branches of the military in general. So um, deployment can be inside of the continental U.S. or it can be outside of the U United States. So even people in the National Guard or the reserves, they can be deployed um, like an active deployment to Washington, D.C. to protect the Capitol. There can be um, any, any type of leave over three months from a family could be considered a deployment. Um, so depending on the branch, again, um, it can range from six to 15 months um, at this time. So there's two major sections of a deployment and that's the deployment itself, but then it's also the redeployment. Um, and when I talk about the redeployment, that is when the soldier is transitioning back home and trying to transition back into home life. So in the beginning, you have the deployment, you have the separation, you're trying to get on to a schedule. The mom has a newborn and she's trying to handle how, how am I going to be a mom? How might I work? How might I, you know, handle childcare or how am I going to handle this solo parenting? Um, but then on the opposite side, the service member who is deployed is, could be struggling with how am I going to help my significant other at home? How am I going to support them when I only have words and videos to say. I can't physically be there to help through a rough night. I can't physically be there to help during these times of need. So when we talk about the reintegration um, or the redeployment, um, you know, you kind of think about, oh my gosh, like they're coming home. This is going to be great. And if you're working with, you know, females or anybody who's having a spouse come home in, in a counseling setting, they might be like, yeah, we're super excited and this might be awesome. But then it's like, but I have this schedule set. And what if they, it's going to throw off my schedule that I've had for the past six, 12, 15 months. And how am I going to reintegrate them back into my life? And how are they going to get back into home chores and how are they going to get back into all of this everyday family life? How are we going to um, discipline our child? You know, the parent at home might have one way, but the parent who is just coming home might have a different way. So there's a lot of difficulty in, in both aspects. So with postpartum, um, I feel like that everyone has heard of postpartum depression. That is the main um, issue that we see come from moms um, after having their baby. Um, and this depression um, can look like a depressed mood, a lack of interest, um, an increase or a decrease in appetite. And like I said, it's commonly recognized. So 10 to 20% of postpartum women experience anxiety or depressive disorders, which can have detrimental effects on the mother, the child, and the family. And these effects can be um, long-term. 
So I've talked about a little bit about the postpartum depression aspect, but I want to speak on the postpartum anxiety. So when I had my child, um, I didn't know that postpartum anxiety existed. I had only heard about um, postpartum depression. Um, and postpartum anxiety can look like uh, restlessness, um, excessive worry, or fatigue. Um, and I do have to say that it, it's harder to recognize postpartum anxiety because those displaying factors are, are common when you're just having a newborn. Um, so of course, uh, a mom might struggle a little bit with restlessness um, because, you know, we're, we're worried about our baby, you know, well, are they breathing when they're sleeping? They're not crying. Do I need to be in there? Um, just different things like that. Um, and fatigue obviously is going to come with a newborn, but it's being able to recognize that in themselves, but also the support of the partner being able to recognize that, Hey, I'm seeing that I'm seeing that you're really restless or when you're trying to sleep at night, um, you're tossing and turning, um, just different things like that, that we can really hone in on, on the anxiety aspect of it. So unfortunately, mothers are only screened for postpartum depression, um, or postpartum anxiety at the newborn appointments. So mothers are screened, um, before they leave the hospital. And then they are screened at the six week checkup, the three month checkup, the six month checkup. And it's kind of challenging because when you go to these appointments, you know, the mom is going to be focused on the baby. Is my baby doing okay? Is my baby growing? Is the baby gaining weight? Is, is the baby reaching the proper milestones? And I remember they handed me a clipboard and they gave me a marker and they gave me this like 10 question assessment. How are you feeling with this? How are you feeling with that? And of course I kind of just went through it, right? Check the block because I just want to focus on my baby. Well, that was the screening. So, you know, I passed the screening or I, in that time I was like, oh, I don't feel like this right now. Oh, I don't feel like this right now. Cause I'm, I'm happy to be there with my child. So I feel like there needs to be a change in, in the way we address postpartum depression and anxiety with, with mothers um, and especially with spouses who might be deployed. Mothers are going to these appointments alone. So we are 100% focused on that child and handling the stroller and handling the bags and handling all these different things. So it's really important to recognize postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety. So with uh, different etiology, etiology and different treatments um, should be considered for both of them. Um, and Dr. Brown is going to speak on how the brain affects the women. Brain okay, um, I just want to thank you very much, Caitlin. I appreciate that. Um, and, I, and I appreciate your service too. Um, as we, when we started off, we talked about our common connection with the military. Um, she being in the military and being a military spouse currently um, and myself being raised in a military family. Uh, the other con there's another connection and it has to do with postpartum anxiety. I have a good friend, her name is Kyla. And when Kyla um, had her child um, several years ago, we've known each other for about 15 years. Our first time out of her house, we went to the mall. Um, she had a stroller and we were on the second floor of the mall. Um, and, I, and I noticed she was acting a little bit off for her, but I knew that she had had a, a baby not too long ago and I recognized there were changes that were happening, but I didn't know what they were. I noticed that her shoe came untied and she was wanting to tie it, but she didn't let go and wouldn't let go of the stroller. So she had one hand on the stroller and the other hand, she, and I was like, I'll hold the stroller, it's okay. And like, I was like, by the way, I didn't know the mall tilted any and where's the stroller going to roll? You know, it's okay. And so. I held the stroller, she tied her shoe, and I said, hey, I don't mind pushing the stroller for a while. And as I started pushing the stroller, I noticed her eyes got really big. She walked loomingly beside me, watching my every movement. 
And I said, okay, what's going on? You know, after you've known someone for years, you can say that, okay, what's going on? And she said, I'm just afraid that he's going to fall off. I said, fall off what? And she said, fall off the second floor of the mall. And I said, well, first of all, you've got him wrapped up like a burrito and he would have to scale or bound over that five foot glass to, to fall off of the second floor. Um, and if he does that, we should probably rename him like Houdini Jordan, kind of after Houdini, the great magician and Michael Jordan, the great basketball player, because I think that's the only way that that's going to happen. But then I just noticed this continued sensitivity and that I had not seen in her before. And I was like, hey, look, that's fine. Let's go to the first floor. We went to the first floor. She found some problems there. There were too many people. There was this, there was that. I was like, well, let's leave them all. And um, what, what came out of that is um, this recognition that she was struggling with postpartum anxiety. Um, so she followed up with, the, uh, with her physician um, and in her case, uh, they recommended medication. Also support group, um, which is where I came in as well. Uh, I actually began to attend the group with her and became the medical director of the postpartum depression and anxiety group at our local um, university hospital. And I served there for a couple of years, learned so much about postpartum depression and anxiety. I felt so very fortunate to be there. But part of what I took away from that was the isolation and the misunderstanding and the misdiagnoses of these different things. When we think about postpartum um, depression, uh, you know, we, we look at what some people would consider the happiest day of your life. And when it's not, it's a, it's a real downer. Um, it's a struggle and you don't understand why. Caitlin, if you'll move forward to the next slide set. Absolutely. So we talk about the two neural pathways. Um, I tried to do some psychoeducation with the group that I was with because some of it is a misunderstanding. Some of them, they're not aware. They just think that something's wrong with them. So we start talking about the, the neural pathway, the neurobiology and stuff of what's happening with inside of them. Um, and we talk about the amygdala highway and the, um, the cortex highway. And so if, if I was gonna try to use like a story to illuminate these two pieces and how they interplay with a mom, think about this. Mother just dropped her toddler off at daycare, um, on her way to work, trying to remember if she placed the EpiPen in her child's bag because her child is um, deathly allergic to bee stings. At that moment, an ambulance goes by, sirens are blazing. So in that moment, the amygdala has, is fired. Um, 1 20th of a second, before we can even think about it, um, you're in that fight or flight response where well, the cortex begins to kind of begin to think about everything that could be wrong and what could be going wrong with the child. Um, it helps to kind of put that in terminology, of course, that the clients understand, but also in a case situation that they may kind of grasp. Um, the epicenter, the amygdala is the epicenter for neuroception, which is like our brain's constant um, uh, scanning of our environment for threats. And when uh, mothers have, you know, of course, when they become mothers and they have children, they begin to scan their, the, the, the area for threats, not just for themselves, but for their child too, which makes them hypersensitive. Um, and also they can, it can cause uh, anxiety. Um, so if you will move forward, Caitlin. So the cortex has fewer connections to the amygdala. Amygdala has more connections to the cortex. And what this basically means is the amygdala, once it's fired, the cortex is just along for the ride. So when the amygdala, when the fight or flight is fired and you're just like set off, the cortex where we go to think and process through and um, focus on things, it's really just along for the ride at that point. And so um, if you've ever had a client in session actually that was triggered um, you may be spending a lot of your time doing grounding and breathing techniques in order to actually calm and breathe and soothe um, the client so you can get to the next stage. step of therapy. Rarely does that take place while the um, amygdala has been fired. The amygdala has a path, um, pathway that is swifter for anxiety. All anxieties run through the amygdala at some point, but there are two different specific types of anxieties. One that's cortex facing, and in, in other words, it's focused on cortex, it's focused on rumination or thoughts, um, these kinds of things. 
that kind of come up. And the other part is amygdala based. Sometimes when the amygdala actually is fed and it's a little bit larger and it's on, you know, kind of in, um, in, in, in enraged, um, uh, heat hot, it would be hot, um, triggered, these kinds of things. When that's set off, when the amygdala is set off, um, then what happens is the cortex uh, loses ground and our ability to kind of work through and solve issues and problems. Okay, Caitlin, if you'll move forward. All right, so when we talk about the cortex, if I'm dealing with a mom um, that really has a graphic image of everything that could, could go wrong, let's go back to the mother who dropped the toddler off that wasn't sure if the EpiPen was there. So the right cortex is the part of the cortex that we, you know, is used uh, to create. Um, when we think about um, all the horror movies that have ever been created, they came out of the right cortex. When we think about some of our strongest anxiety and even panic, it comes out of the right cortex. Um, so you can do amazing things, very creative things with the right cortex. You can also create some really awful things with the right cortex. So I, what I'm listening to with the mom that comes in that's struggling with a lot of right cortex-based anxiety as it relates to um, the, the depression or the anxiety, there's usually a very vivid images um, pictures, things that they talk about. They say, well, I just keep seeing this thing that goes over and over in my head or, you know, this vision, or they talk about things that, you know, kind of lead you to believe that they're kind of creating this environment of um, awfulization and catastrophizing and whatnot. When we think back about the mom on the way to work that couldn't remember if she put the epi EpiPen in the, um, in the bag, um, she could have this image of um, her child in that ambulance. Um, and they're trying to resuscitate that child in the ambulance. And just this graphic picture and that graphic picture, what that does is feed the amygdala more anxiety via neurochemicals and actually increases that anxiety and, and to the point where it can actually cause anxiety attacks or panic attacks. And sometimes it often does. Okay, Caitlin, if you'll move forward. All right, left cortex. So then we think about love, logic, thought, that kind of thing. Um, but specifically, we think of uh, low-grade long-term anxiety or stress, worry and rumination. So um, I uh, was raised in a, house, in a home. I was fortunate enough to have my, grand, my grandparents, both sides at some point, live with myself and my, my family. Um, and my grandmother was a um, consummate worrier and ruminator. Um, this uh, often comes from the left side of the cortex. It's where that, that is processed. And so you could think about all the different things that could go wrong, might go wrong, the things that you could worry about. And what it does is cause this low grade um, anxiety and sometimes depression to just kind of sit there. And there's not really like a, a we don't see as much of the panic and the anxiety related features, but there's just this um, kind of constant internal turmoil and uh, problem sleeping, usually due to those ruminating thoughts and those worries that continue to kind of follow the person into the bedroom. As a matter of fact, a large percentage of the sleep issues that we see um, are not neurochemical, but thought-based. And a lot of it has to do with the left-based um, cortex anxiety. So when you're seeing that mom who's um, ruminating and worrying about everything that could go wrong. What am I gonna do with this child? What happens with this? What if, what if, what if, what if? Well, there's a lot of cases of the what ifs. You'll begin to hear that uh, with them. We, it's important to know um, what part of the brain, the anxiety or the depression may be focused in because that can also focus our treatment plan. Okay, up next, the intensity of the right cortex then the frontal lobes. Okay, Caitlin, if you'll move forward. The full frontal lobes, um, the prefrontal cortex, loaded, located on either side of the eyes, the forehead, um, largest lobe. Also, um, the most challenging uh, to access neurologically. So it's the part that we're most proud of. Um, as therapists, we can think through things um, and whatnot with, uh, you know, with that part of the brain. We think around problems. We help clients um, uh, with our therapies from that part of the brain. 
it controls impulses and emotions. And we also do a lot of assessments in that of uh, situations and people. Slowest portion regarding processing involved in obsessive um, doubts. Now obsessive, you notice that we've talked about the left cortex and um, with rumination, but this part of the brain is where we have our deepest thoughts when we're really kind of, you know, um, I've had an opportunity, actually there's several people on the call um, that I have uh, talked with late at night that have had thoughts that they needed to work through. And, um, and, and you can tell they're accessing that deep part of that, the, that prefrontal, left prefrontal cortex where they're really going deep and they're thinking through. You can also go through some really deep issues and build really deep issues that are not there. Um, obsessive doubts, worries, and concerns. So it, it's um, obsessive. It gets um, uh, beyond that really kind of um, superficial um, state. Uh, we go to a, a deeper worry, the existential factors that keep us up, existential anxiety and existential-based depression and these kinds of things. Um, if you have a mom that comes in and, you know, now she's like, you know, I don't know what my role is in life and I, I'm having role confusion and I don't know if, if I'm a good parent and, um, you know, will, will um, um, this child end up in therapy later and all of these different kinds of things. Then we can say, well, this person's spending a lot of time there and, and that it's specifically that left prefrontal cortex. Okay, Caitlin. Bringing it all together. So we go back. What happens when all of it kind of comes together? Well, it can create a firestorm. Because when you think about the mom that we left in the beginning, who was on her way to work, dropped her toddler off, could not remember if she left EpiPen in um, the bag or not. And she saw the ambulance with the, the sirens blazing, go by her. And so the amygdala initially, think about the amygdala being, fi being fired. There's a threat, there's a threat to the baby. Um, and then the cortex comes online, maybe the right cortex uh, uh, fires and she has this image of the ambulance, the stretcher bringing her baby out after being stung by this bee. And then um, the left cortex comes online and she's thinking about how she's gonna be blamed by all this and her, her significant other is going to blame, blame her for you know, um, not you know, having the epi, EpiPen in there and how will she ever get on the other side of the, the imminent um, issue that's being uh, um, waylaid several blocks away because of uh, her forgetting to put the EpiPen in the, uh, in the case. All these things are going on um, within seconds, um, within milliseconds um, with regards to the amygdala, but then uh, um, people can camp out in the other part of the brain for extended periods of time, building uh, increased anxiety or deeper depression um, and these things work together. Um, and we usually end up with these clients that have um, some, uh, some aspects of anxiety or depression that are happening in different parts of the brain. It really helps to kind of narrow in the focus of what they're struggling with the most. It helps us with treating them better. Okay, Caitlin, if you'd like to move forward. All right, so before I get into interventions, uh, I kind of wanted to, Dr. Brown had brought up a story about his, his friend um, not being able to let go of the stroller or not being able to tie her shoe because she didn't want to let go of the stroller. Um, and it brought up uh, a point that I wanted to, to say is that um, postpartum depression and anxiety does not have to happen or it might not happen right away. Um, so after the mom has the child, um, the first few months could be okay and she could, you know, be managing and um, she might not have any um, depression or anxiety, but as the child is growing and um, your body is kind of going through like the, I like to call it the roller coaster of emotions, um, you might notice a, an increase in anxiety or depression um, throughout throughout the baby's first year of life. Um, so um, one example that kind of comes to mind for me is that um, I kind of knew for myself is that one time I was at, I was at the store with my um, six month old. So she was six months and I was, you know, doing great. She was in the stroller. I was with, with my significant other 
and I was in the store and I wanted to buy a new pair of shoes because I needed a new pair of shoes. And I was walking through the store and I had a coupon for the store. And I, so we specifically went to the mall to the store to buy the shoes because I had a coupon. And when I got to the register, I didn't have the coupon. I had realized I left it at home. And so I just ended up buying the shoes. That had brought me a lot of anxiety. After I had walked out of the store, I started to feel that excessive worry kind of as Dr. Brown. I didn't need to buy those shoes. What if I would have spent that money on diapers? What if I would have spent that money on something else for the baby? What if I would have spent that money on something else for, for anybody else but me, right? So that was when I noticed that I might have had or do have a little bit of that postpartum anxiety and that's okay. But being able to recognize that and, and walking through that is, is what will help, help moms or clients that you might see struggling with postpartum um, anxiety. Cause I feel like a lot of them are like, Oh, I didn't have it when the baby was born, but that, that doesn't mean that it can't develop over time. Um, so some interventions that I want to mention, um, so we have um, military support groups. Um, so around a lot of army posts, there's um, the military family life counselors that are um, counselors that are assigned to specific units. They will see the family, they will see the mom, they will see the service member. Um, we also have um, family readiness groups, which is through the unit as well. Um, these are just groups to keep you connected with your service member, to make you connected to the Army family or the military family in general. Um, they do a lot of deployment readiness um, and deployment readiness fairs. Um, I highly encourage people, especially moms or the spouse that is staying home, to go to these deployment readiness because this helps be proactive to avoid that isolation and that loneliness we had talked about. Um, we know that exercise has been, um, a great intervention for a lot of depression and anxiety. And there is even a workout group for moms that is nationwide and, um, they all get together and they work out with their kids. So it brings a little bit less anxiety down because a lot of moms don't do things because what about childcare? Where am I going to take my child? Where am I going to put my child? I don't have money to afford the daycare. Um, there's also something else called the military one source, which has a lot of great resources again for the service member, for the parent or for the family in general. Um, some other things I like to talk about are um, some applications, um, so phone apps. Um, so there's one called Peanut, and this will um, connect moms with moms in the community. I met one of my best mom friends. We've been friends for over a year now. Our babies are friends, and um, she's one that I know that I can go to, and her family is in the military as well. So her husband is gone a lot, and... Um, I feel a connection with her and she knows what I'm going through. So she's a really good support. And I found her through an app. Um, there are also many other apps like Hello Mamas and Mom Life. Um, and as for like counseling interventions, I would highly encourage um, if it's telehealth, um, going through um, grounding techniques, um, showing the mom how to work through those times of anxiety those times of high stress with the baby. Um, I would also encourage um, breathing exercises or um, even like a removal from, from the, the anxious situation. Um, and what can, what can she do? What are those self-care things that she can provide to herself? Um, as like a face-to-face -face or even virtual um, Cognitive behavioral therapy, so focusing on the understanding that the way we think affects the way that we feel. Um, so having your treatment kind of more based um, on the mom having control over her thoughts so she feels that she's able to change them more. And then the last intervention that I like to talk about is um, MBCT, which is Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. 
Um, this incorpor incorporates a significant comp a component of mindfulness meditation. So I was reading a study and it says that um, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy um, is an um, effective intervention um, for women who are at high risk for postpartum depression. So if they, a doctor knows that a woman is at risk for depression and then she becomes pregnant, she will most likely be seen as high risk for postpartum depression and for um, postpartum or for postpartum anxiety. Um, so there is strong evidence supporting the use of um, mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy in the prevention of depressive relapse and reoccurrence in, in the general population. Um, unfortunately, this study, um, the participants were more women who were not at high risk for postpartum depression or anxiety, but it is a step in the right direction. Yeah, just to add to that, um, Caitlin, and thank you so very much. Um, as, you're, um, as you're looking at treatment uh, with military spouses and other people that are struggling with postpartum depression and anxiety, um, the cognitive therapies and the mindful, uh, mindfulness-based therapies are really good for cortex-based um, uh, um, depression and or anxiety. Um, if someone comes in and they're predominantly right cortex and, and like they're creating a lot of vivid images and pictures, you may want to think about treating them with a creative therapy. So something to kind of keep in mind. And mindfulness um, actually can resonate um, in different parts of, of the brain, the oldest part of the brain to the newest part of the brain. One of the very few things that actually does that. So thank you, Caitlin. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so one um, important aspect of um, with deployment and um, working through deployment, reintegration and all of that is obviously staying connected to our loved ones. Um, so when they are overseas or even in the United States, but still far away, there is a lot of times of limited communication. Um, I have a mom friend here who her husband is part of the explosive ordinance team and when he serves in Iraq, she'll go two weeks at a time without talking to him um, because he's out on mission and he can't have his phone. Um, and I know that is stressful, but when they do have communication, um, we can use video communication. So we have definitely um, evolved from letter writing to now being able to use video communications, whether it be Skype, Zoom, uh, Facebook, um, FaceTime. The challenge that comes with this is working with a little one um, and being able to get that connection with the parent through, through the screen. Um, another way is to create care packages uh, for your loved one overseas. And this is a great activity for you to do at home with kids as well. Um, it involves them in sending love to their loved ones. And it's an activity that you two can do together or three or however many children there are. Um, another helpful tip is setting a schedule. Um, so when the service member um, is able to talk, setting that schedule. So I know one schedule that I like to set is um, bedtime. I know that I can video my spouse at bedtime and that's our time to read books together and then uh, my daughter goes to bed. So, um, and outside of communication schedule, ensuring that that schedule at home is set. So creating as much normalcy as you can for not only yourself or the client that has um, postpartum depression or anxiety, but also for the family. And then one last thing I'd like to talk about is um, the personalized mementos for the children and introducing the five senses for that. So like something for smell, um, having a shirt that smells like their loved one, having um, a pillowcase that smells like their loved one, anything that might remind them of how, how that loved one smells is, can be helpful. Um, a sound. Um, there's a lot of bears that you can record their voice. There's books that you can record their vo voice reading to. If they can't make that bedtime story, you have a recording. Um, and there's a lot of free opportunities um, through those interventions I talked about on the previous slide through um, Military OneSource that will allow for those things to happen. 
Um, I always like to incorporate taste. What's a favorite meal or snack that you all share together? So mine is Dairy Queen. I love blizzards. My spouse loves blizzards. And now my daughter is old enough to have a, a little blizzard of her own. So I try and um, incorporate that every once in a while into our weekly routine. And then last I wanna talk about is touch. Maybe a favorite blanket or um, any sort of favorite teddy bear, doll, something that um, came from the loved one who might be gone. Um, and again, these are all helpful for the, the spouse at home too. It doesn't have to just be for, for the child. Okay, thank you. Um, we just got our warning that we're about to um, end here. Uh, there was one question that came through um, okay. uh, from Monica about heart therapy. And I think that was incredibly efficacious, particularly if you're dealing with someone with right, right brain, the, cr the creative part of their, of their brain is really hyperfunction um, uh, with regards to depression and anxiety, but not that I wouldn't use it with the other parts. We're not gonna actually walk through the two minute relationship builder, but I will um, explain it very quickly so you can do it sometime today. Um, and then we'll um, begin to close. Uh, the two minute relationship builder, basically um, what it does is encourage you to reach out either via text, email, um, or um, calling someone uh, and writing something like that takes probably about two minutes. That's appreciate, appreciating that person for something that they've done for, you, done for you. It could be somebody, it could be a teacher or a professor that you've had in, in the past. It could be um, you know, a parent. And you actually wanna do this like each day. Um, and it only takes a couple of minutes. And what that does is build and deepen your connections. Um, and it's, it seemed to be incredibly efficacious. As a matter of fact, in 2020, latest research that we're showing, the people who navigated the waters of 2020 most effectively said the one thing that helped them the most was um, staying in touch with friends and family via technology. And when you're looking at someone who's deployed, it's not just staying connected, but it's moving. How do we move deeper? How do we deepen those connections? This is a very brief intervention where you reach out to individuals within your kind of circle of, um, uh, uh, of influence or the people that have in influenced you and the people that you've connected with in the past. Um, and it could be someone that you haven't talked to, you talked to or, or thought about in years, sending them a note, letting them know exactly um, why um, they're important to you and how they've impacted you. Incredibly um, impactful um, if done um, daily and it's gotta be really um, truthful and honest. So something to kind of keep in, in mind, we, we were gonna have everyone to kind of think about that other person they can do that with and actually send a text with, unfortunately, we're running short on time now. And so all apologies there. We certainly appreciate your attendance today. We know you have lots of other places that you could be, um, but uh, uh, we appreciate you being here and spending time with us. Um, is we, I, I think we may have time for just a question or two, um, but then we need to probably um, vacate the room so the next people can use that. I just want to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brown and Caitlin, for that presentation. I did post something in, in the chat right now, which was supposed to be the uh, the question, the continuing education uh, questions, because I was trying to uh, paste what you texted in the chat, Dr. Brown, but you sent it as a private message to me. I think you were uh, addressing someone's questions over there. Uh, you might want to uh, paste that in the chat again, but I will go ahead and and repaste the continuing education credits for all of you to answer, and then you can go ahead and you know have your Q and A session. Um, I don't need to be. I have to go to another room to monitor. And uh, I think Caitlin, do you think you can manage this as a as a room monitor as well, mm -hmm. kind of facilitate this process? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, but yeah, Dr. Brown, there's that comment. You might need to put it back in the chat because it came to my to me directly. Yes, I did. And thank you very much, Malik. I appreciate that. Sure thing. Thank you so much. And Caitlin and Dr. Brown, I have questions for you later. All right. Have a good one. <laughs> thank you. Thank All you. Right. Bye bye. Bye. Well, um, if there aren't any questions moving forward, uh, again, we want to thank you uh, for your time on behalf of Caitlin and myself. Not that she can't speak for herself because she can. 
and yeah. she does quite often. <laughs> I want to say thank you very much. And thank Kate, thank you, Caitlin, for having me along uh, for uh, this presentation. Oh, thank you. Well, have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm. You all take care. Mm 